that we are waking up to for Tuesday, December the 10th, 2024. Uh, I am, so we're in the dark again, um, as we so often are here. Um, and there is, there is so much going on. There is so much to try to understand. And you guys know, I am no Middle East expert. I'm no military expert. I'm just a guy trying to make sense of the world. And hopefully we are doing that together. Now, normally the first thing that we talk about is the overnight missile and drone attacks. As far as I can tell, there wasn't one last night. Now that's highly unusual, highly unusual. And I do not know what it means. We have talked about the fact that the average number of drones for December has been half of what it was in November. And we don't know yet. Is that because the Russians are saving them up for a massive attack? Or are they having supply line problems or they're suffering from the hits against the ammunition dumps? Uh, and drone storage locations that the Ukrainians have made. I, I fully expected a massive attack over the weekend, and it did not come. And then last night, slept right through the night, no drones, no missiles here in Kiev, and apparently no massive attack across the country. There were some rocket attacks, um, but those are ongoing. They happen every day up in the north in the Kharkiv direction and Sumy direction. Some S-300s came over the border, did some damage in those locations. Nothing, nothing else to report. So we shall see. We shall see. I, my expectation now, of course, is that this weekend is when they're going to come, that they're going to come by the hundreds. Um, the fact that there are so few coming right now, uh, if they've got them, you know, we could see like we had a couple weeks ago, the 200 come in one in one night. We'll see. Okay. Now last night again, right? Like nobody can see everything. And last night on the live guys were talking about how uh, Zelensky came out and said that Ukrainian casualties to date have been 43,000. I had missed the tweet. I didn't see it. So after the live last night, I went looking for it. And sure enough, here it is. And you can see, now I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm going to skip to the second half, the third paragraph down. Since the start of the full-scale war, Ukraine has lost 43,000 soldiers killed in action on the battlefield. There have been 370,000 cases of medical assistance for the wounded. Now, you'll notice that the language is very specific. 43,000 soldiers killed in action on the battlefield. So when the Russians strike a force concentration in the rear, is that the battlefield? Or was that a training center and it doesn't count? Because nobody is on the side of the Ukrainians more than I am. But 43,000 seems miraculously low to me. I mean, I would love for that to be true. But again, there is very specific language he's using here, which he may be using to help people feel a little bit better, right? Killed in action on the battlefield. So at any rate, this is the tweet that it came from. Uh, if you're interested in pausing it and reading the whole tweet, go right ahead. I'm going to move forward. Right now, in the Pakrov's direction, according to Forbes magazine, the Russians have assembled nine uh, brigades and regiments for a total of 18,000 troops that are getting ready to make a big push toward Pokrovsk. That's a lot of men to add to the fight. The, imp the implication that Forbes was making was that these guys are expected to either overrun Pokrovsk and, and finally take it, or 
if they can't, that the Russian forces in the area of this entire offensive will culminate. That is to say, they will simply run out of the men and the equipment to continue. When this push is coming, now we've seen force concentrations build up not just in Pokrovsk, right? We saw all those guys moved into Kursk. We saw all those guys moved into Zaporizhia, and we're also expecting a big push down in Zaporizhia. And Russia wants to do all of this before uh, Trump is inaugurated. So these are places to watch. These are hot spots to watch on the Ukrainian front. Now, the big news, of course, is Syria. Uh, the Kiev Post published incredible drone footage of the cars going into Syria from Turkey. Um, there's similar footage uh, from Lebanon. There's similar fo footage from Jordan. All the Syrian rebels, now the Syrian leadership, has said publicly that all Syrians in exile are welcome to come home to a free Syria. And it appears that they are. It appears that they are. Now, estimates vary. Um, anywhere from 10 to 13 million refugees are out of the country from Syria, many of them in Europe. Uh, there was a video yesterday of Syrians in Scotland celebrating the liberation. This could go a long way toward easing some of the pressure of the immigration and refugee crisis inside of the EU and other European countries. By enabling these folks to go home and contribute to the rebuilding of Syria, their home, and could diffuse some of the tension that the far right is using with their anti-immigration policies in Europe. And the stoking of fears of, of immigration, right? We see a lot of that. Now, we had a big laugh yesterday about the fact that Russia had to ask a NATO partner for help in getting its guys out of Syria, right? NATO, uh, Russia asked Turkey, please give our guys safe passage, won't you, pretty please, sugar on top. And Turkey, with its fetish for assisting Russian terror in the world, agreed. And so video appeared of columns of Russian equipment and men leaving the eastern part of the country and headed toward their safe evacuation routes in the west. Now, whether or not they make it, there's over a thousand different militias, each with their own agendas inside of this country. It may be the Turkish-backed rebels that have ousted Assad or are taking the credit for it, but they are certainly not the only actors in country. And we have other reports of Russians surrounded in their military bases, of Russians disappearing, literally hundreds of troops disappearing along with dozens of armed vehicles. So some of these guys will get out. I think some of them won't. But Turkey is helping where it can. Another big laugh yesterday to see the Russian MOD go from calling the Syrians terrorists to calling them rebels to calling them the opposition all in a matter of hours as the situation changed was a riot. And now you have Peskov. Well, we'll talk about that in one second. This is uh, the Syrian delegation at the Moscow embassy raising the rebel flag over Moscow. What a joy to behold, huh? Now, this chick, this is Ina Rook. And I, I don't say that to be rude, but, but you know, uh, Ina. Hmm. Uh, Ina is a German journalist, uh, well known for her coverage of, in Europe, for her coverage of Russia. And uh, speaking from Moscow, she had some very interesting things to say, boy. Um, she is reporting that the Russian foreign ministry 
has said, we allowed Assad to fall. We allowed it. We gave it our permission and our blessing. They allowed it. What a joke. But wait, it gets better. We would like to keep our bases in Syria and hope the new leadership will accept that. Bullshit, motherfuckers. You think that the rebels that you've been murdering in their homes, their families, their villages, destroyed, gone, you think they're going to welcome you in? Having been armed and trained by the Ukraine, well, at least trained by the Ukrainians. Maybe the Ukrainians gave them some drones too. Um, by the Ukrainians to hunt Russians. You think these guys are living in a fantasy world. They're living in a fantasy world of their own creation. The, the, the rebels, the new leadership in Syria, have given the Russians 48 hours to get out if they can. And that's where we're at with that. Now, uh, another uh, a famous Russian propagandist, Captain Ilya Tumanov, uh, has said... We are leaving Syria. Preparations for the withdrawal of equipment have begun. A little late, but that's okay. Syria is over. The Turks took Syria without a fight. He went on to say, it looks like we have reached an agreement with Turkey. Syria is theirs now. We have been stabbed in the back again. Unbelievable to me that it was Russia that in 2016 broke the ceasefire agreements with Turkey, uh, which Erdogan took as a betrayal by the Russians, that his somehow fighting back is stabbing them in the back. It is from this place of deep, grotesque insecurity, coupled with a grandiosity that is unparalleled in the world, that the Russian political structure functions in the world. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, now this guy is uh, Linda Burgess, and he is the former Lithuanian foreign minister. I'm sorry, Lands Burgess, Lands Burgess. He's Lithuanian foreign former minister, and a big fan of Ukraine, a big supporter of Ukraine. He said something very interesting. The Syrian example shows that Russia can be kicked out. Uh, the Baltics were right. There is no need to fear the bear. Don't fear the bear. Have no, do not fear the bear. So world reaction. To this, as well as the Russians' own reactions to this in uh, geopolitical swing that has redefined life in the Middle East. Think about it. The Iranians are cut off now. Their whole supply route for uh, funneling weapons to Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, is gone. Every They're cut off and isolated. And that's a good thing for the world. Now, in terms of gl global reaction, the Israelis, boy, are taking a very aggressive position. They have crossed the border from the Golan Heights into Syria. They are said to be only 16 miles from Damascus, about 22 kilometers from Damascus. Israeli tanks are over the border. Now, why is this? Why are they making this ground offensive into Syria? I think this is the big concern with them. Oh, by the way, too, they've, they've made 300 airstrikes on Syria in the last 48 hours, the Israelis. And they appear to be targeting the chemical weapons storage facilities of the Assad regime. Now, look, we know that Assad had a thousand tons of chemical weapons back in 2014 before he signed the chemical weapons ban. We know he kept at least 1% of that. So a, a, 
uh, about a hundred, or I'm sorry, about a thousand tons. Uh, wait, no, I said that wrong. Sorry. Um, he had about a hundred tons. He kept 1%. So one ton that we know of. The rest were supposedly destroyed or back in 2018, he used them on his own people. That's when uh, Trump called in the tomahawk strikes against the Assad regime, which Russia did not appreciate at all, right? But it appears that the stockpiles of chemical weapons are what the Israelis fear, that they want to know that those stockpiles have been secured or destroyed and so they are they are in Syria trying to make sure that that happens and that there's no possibility that elements within Syria might use them against the people of Israel. That appears to be why Israel is there and what they're doing. Now, for our part, the United States is not sitting still either. Again, I had not heard anything about this, but last night on the live, people were saying, what about U.S. strikes in Syria? Well, we've been striking inside Syria. For us, it's a different goal. We don't seem to be going after the chemical weapons factories or uh, the stockpiles, but rather against IS, the Islamic State in Syria. Now, I again, not a Mideast expert. I genuinely believed that the U.S. with our Kurdish allies had eliminated the Islamic State in Syria under Trump. Remember, that was a claim that Trump had made. And I really, all these years, I've believed it, that it was one of his successes. Turns out it wasn't. Of course it wasn't, right? They weren't defeated. They were never defeated in, in Syria. They just went underground and they continued to grow like a cancer. Well, the U.S. has followed them around, knows where they were, and launched 75 airstrikes against IS positions inside of Syria. Now, this seems to have a twofold or threefold meaning. Or the U.S. is trying to signal three things, I think. One, saying to the Syrian leadership, look, our planes are here. They're ready. We can strike anytime we want. It also says to the Syrian leadership, we could have stopped you in your tracks, but we didn't. We let you march. We Assad was our common enemy. Don't now become our enemy too. And then finally, I think that they were saying to IS, get the fuck out of Syria. We're not going to tolerate you here. And that all seems to be the American position. By the way, we've got a thousand guys on the ground in Syria. And so they're there working with the Kurds, um, the, the secular democratic movement inside of Syria, who has also been in touch with uh, the HTS folks. And they seem to have some detente between them though there has been reports of some skirmishes between the two groups. It's also being reported that the Kurds are taking Russian positions. So they've surrounded a Russian military base in the Trans-Euphrates area, uh, in homes. They've surrounded the oil refinery where uh, the Russians are, are, it's a Russian oil controlled area. Uh, it's a Russian-controlled oil refinery. Um, so Russians are surrounded and trapped in various parts of the region. Now, what we are learning from the fall of Syria is that internally, inside of Syria, the country's on a, a geopolitical knife edge. Lots of competing forces, lots of armed groups, lots of opportunity for violence. And which way it goes is anybody's guess. From the Russian perspective, we have learned that this was a major geopolitical defeat for Russia 
but it was also, what may not be as clear, it was also a logistical and economic defeat. This ship, this ship is the Matros uh, uh, Posnich, Posnich. It's a grain ship. It's carrying hundreds of tons of stolen Ukrainian wheat. Right now, it is circling Cyprus because it has nowhere to go. It was supposed to go to Tartus, but it's not going to Tartus now, is it? So it's got nowhere to go with all of its stolen Ukrainian wheat. Tartus and the Himini Air Base were a central logistics hub for the sale of stolen Ukrainian produce, for resupplying the troops in Africa. This is critical. The loss of Tartus means that the supply route for reinforcing African adventures on part, the part of the Russians is gone. The easy shipment of timber from the Central African Republic is gone. The easy transit of gold from the gold mine in uh, Mali to pay for Iranian drones is gone. This is the house of cards collapsing. And on that subject, very quickly, one last thing. There is some incredible research coming out of Stockholm by a guy named Pavel Luzin, who has analyzed uh, data regarding Russian ex arms exports. Get this. In 2021, Russia was the number two arms exporter in the world, exporting 14.6 billion in arms a year. In 2022, after the full-scale invasion, that fell almost by half to 8 billion. It fell another half in 2023 to 3 billion. He is predicting that by the end of 2025, or 2024, pardon me, by the end of 2024, total arms sales for the Russian Federation will be about a billion dollars, a 93% loss of revenue. Incredible. Russia has been displaced as the number two arms exporter in 2023 by France, knocked down to number three. With this, they could be knocked down the ladder as far as seven on the list. And I'm sorry, that's just good for everybody. All right, guys, that's the news that we are waking up to for um, Tuesday, December the 10th, 2024. I would remind everybody, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, we're working on getting a bunch of baked goods to the frontline guys for Christmas. Um, I have about... The Patreon folks have already come through with about two fifths of the budget that we need to get this done. So if anybody else can help with that, um, if you didn't see the appeal video, it should be right below this one on the Patreon. So thanks, guys. Happy holidays, everybody.